Cliff, uh, I chose that as a, a charity to uh, support during all our visits to the 50 odd clubs, 56 clubs or whatever that we did through from uh, the end of July through to very recently. Because of my illness late last year, we had to delay a couple of clubs. But Operation Cliff has been going since uh, 2003 from the Box Hill Club in Victoria, and it's directed towards um, kids in Bangladesh uh, who suffer from uh, cleft palate. And there are literally hundreds of thousands who haven't been treated over an accumulated sort of past. But each year there's anything up to 4,000 being born with the problem. In this country, they're automatically handled and, um, and corrected within weeks after birth. So we very rarely see anyone these days with this condition. But in a country like this, it is, a, it is everywhere. And it marks that person for the rest of their life, ostracises them in many respects because of the habits that they have to, uh, or the, the, the way in which they eat and drink and, and the way they look. And, it's a, and it takes manifestations which are um, very, very, very severe with the teeth external to the face and all sorts of things. And so it's, I'm very pleased I chose it. It's, uh, it's had a very good response around the district and we're, we're, we have sent a substantial amount of money down to, uh, to the base of Operation Cleft in Box Hill. So this club was one of the clubs that contributed and I'm very proud of you for doing it. So thank you very much. Well, hey, give yourself a clap. Now, <coughs> I've got a limited amount of time, so I said this this would be a potted a potted uh, version of a story. Uh, but it's a strange thing, you know. I'm in my mid seventies, and it's a long time since I was a little fella in a farming district west of Sydney in the Hawkesbury Valley, and I can remember walking barefoot in the frost. They were pretty tough little buggers in those days, <laughs> and. Uh, and it's strange how that long trek that you have through your life uh, has brought me all the way down to Sanctuary Cove and, and to this club and uh, through a, a wide variety of experiences which uh, have been enriching, sometimes very taxing and difficult, but uh, in every respect it's been, a, it's been a, an eventful journey. Uh, I was educated in a one teacher school uh, not far from uh, the Macquarie towns of Windsor and Richmond, up in the hills where we had our orchard and, and chook farm and grew vegetables along the creek flats and uh, and that one teacher school, uh, you know, they were quite remarkable things. Any of you been through a one teacher school? Yeah, you have, uh, Graham. Yeah, they're fascinating things. You all sit in one room and they put they put the, the junior grades in one end and then you, you go all the way up. And the poor old teacher has to operate through the day, jumping around, giving them work. But surprisingly enough, you do learn your, your literacy and your numeracy is quite uh, is quite amazing when you come out of that sort of uh, uh, that sort of factory. And they were good teachers. Anyway, I uh, was uh, successful enough to get a scholarship to Sydney University. You studied uh, agricultural science. Uh, went from there to a career through. Um, Papua New Guinea and then into Queensland um, in government work and then I left government uh, work in the mid 60s and uh, I worked with the sugar industry for a period of time in Sydney um, and um, uh, in CSR and then I joined the fertiliser business and the chemicals business which a couple of you here would be very familiar with Graham and and Neil, and I became marketing manager ultimately of uh, what was then Consolidated Fertilisers, which became Incitec Pivot, which is now listed on the exchange. Um, and that was a, a you know, pretty exciting business, selling product all the way from here to, to, to Perth, and um, uh, having a really challenging time. We had a huge merger in the industry after a severe drought and collapse of rural industry in 1969-70 and, 
and it was a pretty tense time and for about six months we didn't know if we had a job and um, that, that puts you through the ringer. Uh, but it's good experience. Um, and through all that, uh, I had uh, uh, some tempestuous times. I had a first family with four children, the four lovely kids, and uh, they are very, very close to me uh, these days. Uh, then I remarried in um, the early 80s, and I had two more children. So I've got six children of my own, uh, and they vary in age from 24 up to 51 this year. So it's, that's a substantial number. Um, and then I met uh, this beautiful lady here in 2003, and we decided that we liked each other. And after a couple of years, we we got together and married. And uh, as a consequence of that. Uh, we stack up all our kids and I think between us, because I had one stepchild in addition to the six already, and Sandy had four children, and then, so we, so we ended up with, I'm responsible for this stack of kids with Sandy. <laughs> and, and then we have a stack of grandkids. I think, where are we up to with grandkids? Ten. Ten. So, this is quite a remarkable sort of life when you have all these kids around you and you ring up, you've got to sort of do a bit of a tally, who did you phone last and, and who should you phone next because you don't want them to think you haven't phoned them. And so you keep track of the front and they range all over the place but the furthest from here is uh, in New Zealand that Sandy's, one of Sandy's big broods is over in Monganui. Uh That's where there are five grandkids all daughter, all kid, all girls, um, and I have my youngest son is assistant manager of Burnett Downs on the Barclay Tablelands, and he's very hard to contact because he's always out somewhere, up in a plane or or mustering, or, you know, because it's three and a half million acres, and so it's a it's very hard to get him. But through all that, it's been a very very intensive sort of career life. I haven't retired, really, in a strict sense. Although I just took a tentative step towards it about 12 months ago in terms of financial management in preparation for this, uh, this uh, terrible prospect of what someone might do. And I won't, I won't go any further than that because we're not allowed to be political here, you know, hand on heart. <laughs> uh, we're an apolitical organisation, Elliot, so you can see that. And, 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 and Abby, we're very, very careful not to talk politics here. Um, and, um, but um, it so happened that in 1967 I took a step that was extremely significant in my life. I joined the Liberal Party in Newcastle. At that stage I was working with CRA, they had a fertiliser plant, at Cockle Creek. Any of you know Cockle Creek on the air yeah, on the top of Lake Macquarie? And uh, we made superphosphate there and then at Walsh Island in the on the river, uh, or Kurigang Island I think it's called. Yeah, Kurigang Kur Island. We, we had a, um, a big plant making mixed fertilizers, high analysis, and we also ultimately when we had the merger we had ammonium nitrate we had a pile of ammonium nitrate that was about as big as this building and it would have blown Newcastle to kingdom come <laughs> if anyone had ever detonated it. it you know, because that is what the terrorists use at the moment for all their bombs in Iraq and, um, and Afghanistan, ammonium nitrate. And we had this, this pile and you'd look at it and I'd always think, poor old Newcastle, because it was just over the river from the city and it would have flattened the whole of Newcastle. There was something like 10,000 tonnes in the pile. It, was, it would have been a Hiroshima explosion. And, uh, but, you know, the, the 1960s was a free and easy decade. We did a lot of things, you know. When I was in New Guinea working, we used to send the, uh, the, the, the lads on the, up the coconut trees to um, to do all sorts of things, get samples of leaves and everything. They used to shinny up, they'd get the leaves, and then you'd send them back up to get a better sample. But the 